Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Chairman, uh, good morning. Uh, we all know that endovascular techniques have revolutionized the treatment of aortic diseases and those who still think that endovascular procedures remain limited to acute complicated type B dissections, I think they are running far behind. Um, the ongoing process of endovascular techniques will undoubtedly further change our approach also in the repair of AAAs especially in poor candidates for open surgery, patients with limited physiological reserve, especially for them, less invasive procedures will become more and more important. And I will elaborate on these three uh, treatment options in the next minutes, realizing that uh, fair comparison between the three techniques is uh, probably not possible because patient groups that received one of these treatments uh, often cannot be compared. What are we talking about? You've seen this slide before. You know the Crawford classification based on the location and the extent of the pathology with the famous type 4 uh, aneurysms, of which type 2 is the most extensive one, involving almost a complete thoracic and abdominal aorta. Eventually, like Hazim Safi has suggested, the type 5 can be added, which is nothing more than a combination of type 1 and type 3. And I'm glad to notice that over the last years, this classification didn't alter uh, since the famous page, uh, the paper of uh, the late Stanley Crawford in 1986. At least it makes anatomical comparisons uh, easier and much more consistent. Let me start with open surgery. It is still the golden standard today. And since randomized trials will probably will be impossible to perform, the results of open surgery will have to serve as the basis for comparison. Open repair has advantages and disadvantages. And the major advantage is, without any doubt, that it has to be seen as a definitive procedure that will last forever. Indeed, re-interventions on the operated thoracobdominal aorta are extremely rare. Even for so-called dilated islands of native aorta after reimplantation of lumbar or intercostal arteries. But of course, it's a major invasive operation with a huge impact on human physiology, maybe the, the most substantial impact there exists. It carries some very specific risks, which we all know, uh, uh, respiratory complications, spinal cord ischemia, renal failure, just to name maybe the most three important of them. But let's not forget that these risks are also present in the hybrid and to some extent also in the endovascular approach. On the other hand, the results of open surgical repair in the hands of experienced surgeons are excellent. And I will come back on that later. In open surgery, there are basically three uh, techniques described up to now. The simple cross clamping technique, putting a clamp above and below the aneurysm, as illustrated here on the left with a, an open triple A, was originally advocated by Crawford. Nowadays, I think it's no longer used in thoracobdominal open repair because the risks of damage of the uh, uh, to a variety of vital organs is is seen much too high. So. I think simple cross clamping anno 2017 can be seen as history. The cardiovascular community has clearly realized that it was absolutely necessary to protect the distal organs in one way or another. And to accomplish that, some strategies for organ protection were described. One uh, realized that a kind of a bypass had to be used in order to limit the ischemic impact to the body. And this resulted finally in the development and the application of the left heart bypass in TAAA surgery. <clears throat> and as a second option, the use of extracorporeal circulation via the left groin was also introduced in this kind of open repairs. The choice of operative strategy will often depend on local preferences and the experiences of the surgical team. Let me reveal something about the surgical results in open repair. Of course, these are so-called best case scenarios of which we all know 
that the real world experience can be less optimistic. Yeah? May I refer to the paper of Rigberg, um, evaluating more than 1,000 patients in California reporting a 30-day mortality of 19%. Especially for these complex procedures, the results of higher volume surgeons are much better than for lower volume surgeons. And to summarize this, I think one should be able to reduce hospital mortality below 10%, as well as acute renal failure and spinal cord problems. And maybe for the, for the latter two, perhaps below 5% are certainly not exceptional anymore. The indications for TAAA repair, open, hybrid, and endovascular are indicated on this slide. All patients with symptoms that can be attributed to the aneurysm itself, after exclusion of different possibilities, should undergo surgery. With that, I mean interscapular pain or chest pain radiating to the back, not responding to modest painkillers, pain that cannot be explained by other reasons, or pain that causes compression to intrathoracic organs. Of course, if there are signs of impending rupture, there is no doubt to proceed quickly. But if there is a frank rupture, very often it's too late. We may not forget that in emergency situations, mortality and the risks of uh, spinal cord problems at least double. So in all cases, the size criterion will urge us to go for surgery or not. Then for high-risk patients, the so-called um, um, hybrid technique has been described a few years ago. Also for patients with so-called hostile thorax, patients with a limited cardiac and or respiratory reserve, or patients with previous extensive aortic surgery. In hybrid repair or debranching repair, which is nothing else than a combination of an open and endovascular treatment, visceral branches of the aorta are debranched depending on the patient's anatomy. The abdominal aorta or the common iliac arteries are often used as new inflow sources prior to the endovascular exclusion of the TAAA depending on the extent of the aneurysm. Via a midline laparotomy and transperitoneal approach, the visceral vessels are bypassed towards the infrarenal aorta or the iliac arteries, as I said, using six or eight millimeters grafts. And this can be combined. Sorry. I don't. I see something else here. <laughs> Well, anyway, I can continue. Um, we use six or eight millimeter grafts to reroute the. Thank you. To reroute the visceral arteries. Um, eventually, this can be combined with uh, renal and arterectomy if necessary. If you anticipate technical problems, a renal protection solution, just as in the classic open repair, can be used. Uh, eventually, standard or customized bifurcated or trifurcated grafts can be used apart from the single bypass technique. And most often, end-to-end -end anastomoses are used. And it is important to ligate the grafted vessels to avoid uh, future endoleaks. And then simultaneously or later, for both options, there are pros and contras. The aortic aneurysm itself can be excluded using endografts from the femoral vessels, the iliac arteries, the abdominal aortic graft, or eventually a pre soon graft to the abdominal aorta rooted to the groin, depending on the specific anatomy, yielding a result as is shown here on the right hand. With regard to the discussion about the timing of the second step, staged or simultaneously, the final decision when to do it uh, is related to the specific condition of each individual patient. But I have to mention again the interval mortality when one decides to discharge the patient from the hospital. 
Hybrid repair has some advantages and disadvantages too. The torochotomy can be avoided as well as the division of the diaphragm, which will certainly benefit the post-operative pulmonary function. But the open abdominal component of the hybrid procedure is in itself a, a major surgical undertaking that should not be uh, underscored and it is certainly not minimal invasive. The endoleaks remain a substantial and still unsolved problem demanding future interventions and long-term data about the patency of the visceral bypasses is still not well known. To give you an idea about the results of the hybrid surgery in torque abdominals, I want to refer to the meta-analysis of uh, Mulakakis in the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery. In his study of about 528 patients with a mean follow-up of 34 months, he found these numbers. And as you can see, the spinal cord ischemia and acute renal failure incidence was about 7%. Mesenteric ischemia 4.5, often leading to death. Uh, prolonged ventilation 8%, 30-day mortality 14%, and the patency of the grafts after more than two years was uh, almost 100%. And his conclusions are very clear. He said, although the hybrid technique provides a less invasive approach, the technique is still associated with a considerable morbidity and mortality. And he continues, High-risk patients, unfit to withstand open repair, are equally likely to suffer significant complications with the hybrid procedure. In the preparation of my lecture of today, I came across a presentation given by Joe Coselli, and the title seemed very appealing to me, what I would prefer for my own Torco-Abdomal aorta. And Coselli's answer to this question was also very straightforward and is illustrated in the next slide. His choice is underscored by the numbers uh, on this slide and in blue you can see the open conventional repairs and in red the results of the hybrid repairs. Although again patients in the mentioned studies have completely different risk profiles, the results seem to be more than evident. The blues beat the reds. And I think with these thoughts in mind, I think and I can close the hybrid approach and step to the total endovascular repair of the thoracoabdominal aorta. In this technique, a unibody or modular aortic main endograft is used to give access to the target visceral arteries, either through fenestrations, as seen on your left, or through branched side grafts, as seen on your right. And the terms used for these are FIVAR and BIVAR, respectively. The gap between the fenestration or the branch graft and the target visceral artery is bridged by a covered stent coming from the axillary artery. And eventually, this can be reinforced by a bare stent to avoid uh, kinking. Finally, the result is shown on your right-hand side, uh, a total endovascular exclusion of the torcoabdominal aortic aneurysm. As with classic open and hybrid repair, endovascular repair has again some advantages and disadvantages. Torcotomy, laparotomy can be avoided as well as the division of the diaphragm with its positive uh, pulmonary function effect. But again, it's an extensive procedure and the contrast burden should not be underestimated, certainly in patients with already preoperative impaired renal function. I think the, the Achilles heel of the endovascular repair remain the endoleaks and again long-term data about the patency of the covered stent towards the viscera is uh, unknown. Despite the less invasive nature of the fenestrated or branched TVAR, the morbidity and the 30-day mortality of many series is somewhat disappointing. And the rates of spinal cord ischemia, myocardial infarction, renal dysfunction are not significantly reduced as might have been expected. Mortality ranged from 0 to 10%, which is not bad, but don't forget, don't, don't forget that it is supposed to be a so-called non-invasive procedure. The rate of paraplegia, paraparesis, is also 
disappointingly high, ranging from 0 to 16%. And in two of the largest series, per paresias and paraplegia is seen in 15 and 8% of the patients after FIVAR or BVAR, despite having a population composed of extant four TAAAs in 40 and 50% of the patients respectively, which is the group associated with the lowest risk of spinal cord injury in open ser series. Renal failure requiring dialysis occurred in 0 to almost 7%, which is comparable to open series. And the incidence of endoleaks varied from six to uh, from 15 to 66 percent, with uh, about one third of the patients requiring reinterventions in the future. I will not go into further details about this technique since it is uh, probably extensively covered by Professor McWilliams in the next presentation. Actually, a patient with a TAAA in general has three treatment options, apart from probably doing nothing and giving only medical antihypertensive therapy. First, the open uh, repair, which is a major invasive procedure that is optimally concentrated in aortic centers in order to achieve the best optimal results. It's durable, long-term results are excellent, and reinterventions are rare. The hybrid repair is the second choice, originally booked for high-risk patients. Its invasiveness should not be underestimated and mortality and morbidity are even higher than the open repair. Endoleaks and bypass patency remain questionable. The third option, the total endovascular repair, is a consequence of the, let me call it, maturization of this technique in the thoracic endovascular repair. It's a non-invasive procedure that offers a lot of perspectives in the future, but the basic risks such as spinal cord ischemia and acute renal failure abide and are still not solved. On top of that, the endoleaks pose a major concern to the future. So as techniques and experiences mature in the future, I foresee a further decline in open procedures making concentration of operations even more desirable, while endovascular procedures will probably grow and perhaps become the golden standard. So the big question today is how to select for your patient the best treatment option. Let me try to help you and suggest an algorithm. If you're nowadays confronted with a patient with a triple T triple A in uh, relatively good health, relatively young, and I realize that is all very subjective, but you know as well as I do that some patients in their late 70s uh, may be in better shape than others in their mid-60s. So age is in itself is certainly not a limiting factor. If there are no major comorbidities related to cardiac, pulmonary, or renal function in these circumstances, I would go for open surgery. Previous cardiac interventions are certainly not contraindications for open surgery. I, on the contrary, I would rather have a patient with his aortic valve incompetence solved beforehand. And um, the same is true for aortic arch repair. With regard to hostile abdomen, since we always use the retroperitoneal approach, uh, previous Transabdominal or transperitoneal um, approaches are not contraindications for open surgery. Torchotomy is another story. One previous torchotomy probably is not a contraindication, but if the patient had previous uh, multiple torchotomies, I think uh, you have to choose, and to, to choose another option, for example, the endovascular um, approach. The renal transplant is not a contraindication. If there are renal artery stenosis, you can perform endartrectomy in combination with your open repair. Of course, patients with connective tissue dis disorders like Marfan or Louis Dietz, always uh, open repair is the first choice because we know that endografts will po 
pose problems in the future due to the ongoing dilatation of the um, native aorta. Maybe in emergency situations, you could think of uh, endografting as a bridge to definitive repair. Having said all this, there is for me another big condition that has to be fulfilled before taking the direction of open surgical repair. Namely, your team should be able to perform open surgery on the open uh, thoracodonal aorta with a mortality of less than 10%, an incidence of spinal cord problems and acute renal failure less than 5% for both. And if not, maybe you should think about referring the patient to an aortic center where these results can be reached. My last slide illustrates a 500 years old painting of Hieronymus Bosch, The Last Judgment, which can be seen in a museum in Bruges. God is sitting on his throne in the middle panel and he decides if you go to the right, the hell, or to the left, the heaven. I don't want to compare open surgery or endovascular surgery, nor with heaven or hell, but I'm sure that patients with TAAA in the future will be divided between these two treatment options. I would like to thank the Society for the Privilege of the Floor.